Hello everybody, welcome to Boxing Science. Over social media, we share hundreds of different exercises that are beneficial to boxing performance. Whether that's a punch specific exercise, a heavy press or a squat, or some explosive rotational work, or plyometric exercise. The most common question that we receive in response to sharing these exercises is, how does this fit into a program? Uh, how far out from a fight we should use it? and how many sets and reps should we do it for? And we're not surprised by this because programming can be one of the most difficult tasks for a strength and conditioning coach or a boxing coach to do. At Boxing Science, we use several key steps to make this process a lot simpler, and we want to share this with you today. So step one is to write down your exercise categories, and that's from mobility to squatting, all the way through to your core exercises. It's a really important task to do this and really effective because we're not just picking random exercises and then trying to fit them into a program. We're making sure that we're ticking the box of the exercises, exercise categories that we need to make an optimal boxing strength and conditioning program. We've got our main ones in black and in the reds down here are the 1%. This is something that we're gonna be covering on a further step. The next step is to look at the level of the athlete that you're working with. Are they a beginner lifter or they're more advanced? And what stage of camp they're in? This has a big influence on the type of exercise that we select in each category. So let's take a squat for example. If we're working with a beginner athlete, we're gonna be working on more foundational movement and strength exercises. Something like a goblet squat, a landmine squat, uh, something that we can develop the movement but not be excessive load that might be dangerous. Working with a beginner lifter, you're not going to get them uh, doing like a max, uh, maximum strength heavy loaded back squat. You need to build up their movement and strength foundations before. So you take that element of working with a foundational athlete and pick out their foundational exercises that fit into each category. Now what stage of camp are we in? So if we're getting close to a fight, we want to need to work on more strength speed, speed strength adaptations. We want it in a lighter, more explosive. So let's use the squat as an example again. Towards the back end of camp, we'll change the emphasis of that squat pattern. So we'll be doing loaded counter movement jumps, squat with bands, something uh, on the lines of that to make sure that we're ticking the box there but we're also meeting the need of the stage of camp that we're in and what adaptations we're trying to target. Once we have all this decided, we're then going to be using this session structure. And this is a structure that we've used at Boxing Science for many years. We've got our mobility, which is uh, a warm up that we do. Uh, every session is the same. So that's working on rotational mobility, shoulder and hip mobility as well as firing up the glutes and the lower body and the core, ready for their strength and conditioning sessions. Then we're going to extended warm-up. This is where we put our plyometrics, our rotational work, and like some single leg work as well. Uh, the reason why it's in an extended warm-up, because it can add as a potentiating tool to get the muscles fired up, ready to go into our key lifts. So we'll write that down. Okay, so the main session structure will be in three key parts. Key exercise one, two, and three. In key exercise one, that's where we're going to be using our main lower body compound lift. This is either a squat or a hinge pattern. Now, we normally go for the squat in session two. The reason why is that squats can create more muscle soreness than a hinge exercise. A hinge exercise is something like a deadlift, deadlift from blocks, etc., etc. What we find is that squatting can create more muscle soreness. We'd rather put that towards the back end of the week. So we'll put squat here, and then we'll put a hinge exercise in session one. The key exercise two is gonna be a push and a pull superset. And push and pull is then divided into two different sections. A vertical push and pull and a horizontal push and pull. And we superset these 
in each one. And it doesn't really matter whether we've picked horizontal or vertical in each one. So on key exercise three is going to be our single leg exercise. Again, this is split up into two sections, knee dominant and hip dominant. A knee dominant exercise is like a lunge or a split squat and we associate that with a squat. So we want to put that in a separate session. So when we do the hinge movement, we'll do the single leg knee dominant. A hip dominant single leg exercise is something like a single leg Romanian deadlift a single leg glute bridge or a hip thrust and we'd like to put that hip dominant exercise opposite to the hinge exercise so we're going to put that when we're going to be doing squatting. With this we're going to do a posterior shoulder exercise as a superset to make sure that we're hitting the rep ranges at a push to pull ratio. And then we've got our core exercises. We've got our four pillars of core training anti-extension, anti-rotation, anti-lateral flexion and we've got hip flexion with neutral spine. So we want to target these four pillars every single session. Now how to do this is we'd normally do a core circuit at, at the end. This will be beneficial for strength endurance and uh, capacity of the core and we'd pick three of these exercises. Now we pick the fourth exercise, the fourth category to be our strength endurance hold. So a prime example would be hip flexion with neutral spine would be a supine core hold and that can be our strength endurance hold rather than hitting that within the circuit. Okay and then we've got to think about the 1%. So we've got a neck training, grip and wrist exercise, we've got um, ankle mobility, rotational mobility, we've got foam rolling too. Where do we fit this in the program? Now this session would normally take anywhere between an hour and 15 to an hour and 45 minutes. So we've got a lot to cover in a short amount of time. With the 1% I'd suggest to either add it on 10-15 minutes on the end of a strength workout but ideally use your conditioning uh, sessions, so your running conditioning sessions as an opportunity to work on these 1%, add it on to the end of the workout or use it as a warm up. Also you can put it onto your boxing sessions as well. So I'll say right, these are your 1% to do a back end of a boxing session, just do a little bit of neck training, a little bit of foam rolling after and then you've got time to do the 1%. It's very hard to pick out all these different elements, put it into a two day split and also work on them 1%. So it's dependent on how committed you are, how dedicated you are to work on these around your other sessions within the week. So the next point is to use supersets. Now a superset is where you do two exercises with a very short rest period in between. Now you want to make sure that this is complementary to make sure that you're not fatiguing the muscle groups and to make sure that you're optimising that weight load. So we normally use an opposite movement. So for example, with a push, we'd fit that with a pull. Now when we're doing our pressing exercises, we're not really fatiguing the lats in the pulling exercise. And it's a great way also to save time. We've got all these different exercises to do within an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes. It can be quite difficult to fit all the exercises in if we're gonna use them as single exercises. So using supersets. These are the supersets that we'd normally do. We'd use a key lift with a posterior shoulder or a core exercise. This isn't really too fatiguing. You know, you're not going to do a really fatiguing core exercise when you're doing a hinge or your squat pattern, but it's something to help complement. You know, we like to do manual holds when we're going into like an Anderson squat or something like that to make sure that the core is firing through them key compound lifts. Or we'd do something like a plank row. That's great for the core, but also great to prepare your shoulders when lifting heavy on trap bar deadlift. So these are some ideas to, to fit in more core exercises within your workout. Again, a push and a pull, single leg with a shoulder exercise, and then using the core training 
uh, as a little bit of a circuit or strength endurance hold at the end. Okay, the next step is rep ranges. This is something that we get asked a lot, you know, how many reps and sets do we do? When working with a beginner lifter, we normally go towards the muscle hypertrophy phase. Now, this is not to put on muscle mass, and we're not going to put loads of muscle mass on them, but it provides the foundations uh, for strength further down the line. So, we'd go for 10 to 12 reps with beginner lifters. Then, as we build up our strength foundations, we go five to eight repetitions, three to five sets. And then strength and power for the key lifts, we'd be working anywhere between three and five repetitions and three to six sets. Now, sometimes we'll go even uh, lower than that. We might go to two repetitions when we're going towards uh, 90 to 95% one RM. But that's the general rule of thumb that we use at Boxing Science. Okay, so the final section that I'm going to talk about is progressive overload. We've got to make sure that we're pushing our body to make sure that it's creating them adaptations and then deloading to allow the body to recover. So we use a simple three to one block periodization model where we have three weeks that are progressively increasing load, no more than uh, 10 to 20 percent uh, total volume load. And then we have a one week deload and before we start building that back up again. So this is a prime example. We'd do uh, five reps, three sets, and then we'd increase the rep ranges, as well as increasing the intensity as well. So it's nice and steadily increasing 80, 82, 85%, and then we're maintaining that intensity on the deload week, but we've dropped the, rep, uh, the sets. So we, we drop the sets from five sets to three sets. That's a very basic way to explain it, but that's a very basic way. There's a, a lot more that goes into it when we're planning out load to deload ratios, uh, but hopefully that gives you a good idea of uh, how we use uh, progressive overload and the three to one uh, block periodization model. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and taken a lot from it and now able to plan out your training more effectively and have a more confidence in selecting the right exercises at the right time. If you want any help in this, uh, there's loads more information either on the Boxing Science membership or the Train Like Champion membership where you can follow our programs that we deliver down here at the Boxing Science Performance Centre. The link is in the description and if you've got any more questions, find them in the comment box below or contact me at dannywilson at boxingscience.co.uk. Not subscriber yet? Please hit the subscribe button and I'll catch you on the next video.